Hello, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I'm Associate Professor in Neurological Surgery at University of California, Los Angeles. And today we're gonna to talk about one of the most important neurosurgical diseases, brain aneurysms. So brain aneurysms are relatively common. About 6.5 million people in the United States alone have a brain aneurysm right now on one of their blood vessels in their brain. What are brain aneurysms? They're known as cerebral aneurysms, intracranial aneurysms, and they're essentially a small area of weakness on the blood vessel wall that over time with the pressure of the heart beating and the blood rushing by, pounding against this weak spot, it can grow. So why do we care so much in neurosurgery about these brain aneurysms? The rationale is because as these grow, a certain percentage of them can rupture. A little point of bleeding can happen at the very dome as depicted here. When this leaking happens for seconds to minutes, high pressure blood flow is then leaking out of the vessel into the CSF, the fluid surrounding the brain causing high pressure in the brain and the blood itself causes damage to the brain. So up to 50% of patients that have this rupture don't make it through this event. So this is why it's so important to understand the symptoms of brain aneurysms, detect them before they rupture, treat them so that they cannot rupture and prevent these type of catastrophic bleeds. This is a cerebral angiogram of the left internal carotid where dye is injected directly into the vessel harboring the aneurysm so we can see it at the best possible definition. The left middle cerebral artery is seen here, coming towards the lateral side of the brain. And the left anterior arter cerebral artery is seen here, coming to the middle part of the brain. And the large pipe that comes upward from the neck through the skull is the internal carotid artery here. And right here, where the arrow is pointing, is the cerebral aneurysm. The base is called the neck. The top is called the dome. And at this size, we typically recommend treatment if it's safe to do so. So you may be asking yourself, what causes these brain aneurysms to form and grow in the first place? While we don't know that for sure, we know that certain things in people's medical histories can predispose them to developing brain aneurysms. Some of those most common things are having high blood pressure for many years, chronic hypertension. Another is smoking. And then there are a whole long list of other contributors. Now you've had a brain aneurysm discovered, you may ask, how can I stop this thing from growing or rupturing? Well, there's not that much we know of that can stop them from growing or rupturing other than reversing some of the things we know that cause them. To. So one of the things that is very important is to stop smoking if you smoke. Another thing is if you have high blood pressure to keep that with medications and healthy exercise and diet within normal range. And then other things that just make you healthy, like a Mediterranean diet, exercise, sleeping well, are thought to uh, promote overall health and uh, reduce the chances that these things grow. So what are some of the symptoms that may clue us in that we have a brain aneurysm? One of the most common symptoms that leads us to find a brain aneurysm are headaches. Now it's very hard to understand whether having a simple headache that's similar to the ones you've had in the past really indicates you have a brain aneurysm. We don't think that that's the case usually. Um, but sometimes headaches that are more severe than usual or very rapid onset can be related to brain aneurysms. We'll talk about that. Another thing that you can pick up before one may rupture is a, abnormalities in the nerve to your face or eyes. For example, having a dilated pupil on one side and on the same side having a lid lag. Um, and I can show you a picture of that, which is called a third nerve palsy. You can see in the picture on the left eyelid is lagging. And although you can't see the pupils well in this picture, uh, his pupil was actually dilated on that side. That's indicative of a third nerve palsy and this patient did indeed have an aneurysm pushing on the nerve that controlled the back of his eye and eyelid. What are the symptoms of an aneurysm rupture? This is often a very dramatic event where the patients describe an immediate thunderclap, like someone hit them with lightning out of the sky. Worst headache of my life. Very commonly, the patients that experience this kind of headache and uh, related to bleeding of an aneurysm in the brain also have nausea and vomiting. Sometimes they pass out. Sometimes you can have seizures. And if you do end up passing out and waking up, you complain of things in addition to nausea and vomiting, like sensitivity to light, called photophobia. Also, neck stiffness. Um, is another common complaint or finding in patients that have had a ruptured aneurysm. This is extremely important if you suspect someone of having an aneurysm or having, especially having had a ruptured aneurysm, that they go to medical attention as soon as possible. In the United States, that involves calling 911. That's extremely important because ruptured aneurysms that have stopped leaking and the patient has woken up very well may rupture again. So it's a race against time 
to get us to medical attention and have that dealt with before another rupture occurs, which could be deadly. What happens when you find out that you have a brain aneurysm? How do you know if it's going to rupture or not? How do you know if you should have this aneurysm treated or not? So there are some clues of individual aneurysms about how dangerous they are and what, how likely they are to rupture. We as physicians and cerebrovascular experts use these clues to determine what steps we should take to either treat or not treat a given aneurysm in a given patient. So we have a whole long list of things that we know can affect this decision. Um, just a few of them related to the aneurysm itself are the size of the aneurysm. So there's small aneurysms, generally considered to be less than seven millimeters, medium sized aneurysms, seven to 12 millimeters, large aneurysms, 13 to 24 millimeters, and then greater than 24 millimeters are considered giant aneurysms. And the size of the aneurysm is one of the primary drivers of its risk of rupture. In general, the increasing aneurysm size indicates the increased likelihood it will rupture and also generally indicates the increased likelihood it should be treated to prevent rupture. Another important factor is which part of the brain blood vessels this aneurysm is on. It's been discovered that the aneurysms on the front blood vessels in general are less likely to rupture at the same size as an aneurysm in the back part of the brain in the posterior circulation. So for example, a seven millimeter aneurysm on the carotid artery behind the eye is considered to be less likely to rupture than a seven millimeter aneurysm on the basilar artery on one of the back blood vessels of the brain. This is again important on deciding when to treat an aneurysm and at what size it's appropriate to treat an aneurysm. Another important factor is if you've had a prior bleed in your brain, a subretinal hemorrhage, even from another aneurysm that is fixed, any another new aneurysm you may have is considered to be higher risk of bleeding, even at a smaller size and is likely to be treated more aggressively than your average aneurysm. This is a graph demonstrating in a large study called Ishua at the which sizes the anterior blood vessel aneurysms in blue and red the posterior vessel aneurysms and then the sizes here on these different groupings and what their risk of rupture over the five year period of this study was. So you can see very small aneurysms under seven millimeters while not absolutely zero in real life, it does happen that these aneurysms rupture. They're very low risk of rupture if they're anterior circulation and smaller than seven millimeters. Posterior circulation, less than seven millimeters, still had 2.5% chance of rupture in this study, uh, even at this small size over five years. And you see as you get larger and larger, the percentages that it will rupture get higher and higher. So that's one of the studies that determined that size was very important. Other things that can affect how likely an aneurysm is to bleed is family history. So for example, if you've had two first degree relatives, a sister, brother, mother, father, that have had aneurysms, particularly aneurysm ruptures, that is considered higher risk. If you're of the Japanese or Finnish heritage. And then there's other secondary factors that are important, such as aneurysm morphology. Is the aneurysm nice and smooth? That's considered to be safer than if it's extremely irregular or has multiple lobes. Other things that are important to consider are patients' medical conditions. Uh, patients that have uncontrolled blood pressure, for example, are felt to have higher risk of rupture. Patients that are smokers or patients that are active drug users are felt to have higher risk of rupture and may be treated more aggressively. Let's go over how this decision-making may work. This is a 65-year-old female with high blood pressure who was discovered by having blurred vision and an MRI of the brain to have an aneurysm. This is her three-dimensional angiogram, which you can see spinning here. This is the carotid artery coming up. Here is her multiple lobed posterior communicating artery aneurysm here. This is the top of her carotid artery, her anterior cerebral artery, and her middle cerebral artery. So the size was seven millimeters. The location posterior communicating artery is considered to be posterior circulation. The morphology of the aneurysm, whether it's smooth or irregular, was as tri-lobed, so not smooth, as well as an irregular point here that you can see uh, on the angiogram. Uh, so when do you treat or when do you observe this? So there is a calculation that people put together based on many of these factors in the, called the phases score. And according to this score, this patient is below seven years old, has hypertension, uh, has an aneurysm between seven to nine millimeters, has had no prior brain aneurysm rupture. Location is in the posterior circulation or anterior cerebral artery, which gives her a score of eight. 
which means that roughly her five-year rupture risk is 3.2%. And in these cases, this kind of aneurysm are typically treated. So how do physicians detect brain aneurysms? Commonly, brain aneurysms are detected what we call incidentally, by accident, because someone has a headache or hits their head, and it's really not related to the reason they got the brain scan, but we find an aneurysm. To diagnose a brain aneurysm, we need an imaging study. There are multiple types of imaging studies, but the ones that are able to detect brain aneurysms reliably include imaging of the brain with special attention to study the blood vessels in higher detail. One example would be a CTA. This is a CT scan of the head, which is acquired with a machine that, that uses x-rays to be able to see the soft tissues of the skull and brain. Another imaging study is called an MRA. is an MRI, which is slightly different and uses magnetic fields to see the brain and the soft tissues. And there can be sequences designed by radiologists to look at the blood vessels of the brain preferentially and detect brain aneurysms. Finally, the highest resolution imaging that you can get for brain aneurysms is called a diagnostic cerebral angiogram. This involves feeding small tubes and wires under x-ray guidance to the vessels of the neck, injecting dye into the vessel that harbors the aneurysm, and getting high-resolution imaging to see the size, the location, and the morphology of the aneurysm in the best possible detail to make decisions about treatment, how these should be treated, if it should be treated, and by what methods it should be treated. Thank you for watching today the video. If you'd like to see more about treatments of brain aneurysms, please see a following video. I'm Jeremiah Johnson. See you next time.